Hey everyone, welcome back to Coffee and Bible Time. Thank you for clicking on this video. I'm so excited to be doing an in-depth Bible study with you guys today. It is requested over and over again, so I am just so pumped to be doing this with you guys today. It is on Ephesians 5, 15 through 21. So pull out your Bibles, get to a quiet place, come before the Lord on your knees in prayer, and let's do an in-depth Bible study together. If you guys don't know me, I am Ashley. I am currently a Biblical Studies student at Moody, and so I am learning all about the Bible, and I just love it so much. And my goal is to be able to learn all these things so that God can be glorified and so that I can help you walk through the Bible and learn how to study the Bible and learn how to delay in God's Word. So if you like these videos, definitely hit the thumbs up button and also subscribe. That would be very helpful for me. So along with this video, there is a printable, which is so cute, you guys. I created it especially for you. I love how cute this printable is. Not only is it cute, but it's going to be your guide through this video, okay? It's going to tell you what you need to write down, the steps you need to take, and bonus, it's also going to have a commentary in there that I wrote on this section of Ephesians. So it has that extra information that will help you through Ephesians. And honestly, this video is designed to be done with the printable. So definitely go check that out and help support Coffee and Bible Time. And guess what, you guys? This is kind of thrown in here as a little surprise, but the Coffee and Bible Time prayer journals are now available. Yes, they are so available right now. But if you guys want to know more about this prayer journal, I have other videos linked down below of me walking through this prayer journal and me using this prayer journal. I've done a lot of videos. I'm just so excited that it's finally out again for you guys. So I hope you enjoy this. I hope you guys go check this out. It's going to be sold out fast again. I have a feeling. Um, so definitely go get this quickly. Okay, now getting into the in-depth video. This video is going to go fast. I'm going to be going through things like this. That's because I didn't want the video to be like an hour long. So I'm sorry that it goes by really fast. Like it's gonna be hard for you to write while the video is going, but that's why I want to encourage you to pause the video, take your time through it, be praying through it. Not only that, be willing to have this study take a few days. You may not be able to do all this in one day. That's okay, it wasn't designed to do in one day. If this takes you three days to a week, great. If it takes you a day, that's great too. Do it to the end though, ladies. Come on, I know we can do it. Also, don't forget to do this study with a friend or to share this video with a friend and to just collaborate and talk together about this, pray together about this, and it will help you so much more. It will not only help you accomplish this study, but it will also help you grow together as you both talk about the Bible and just grow together in unity. So pause the video right now, share with a friend, do it together. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to challenge you guys to read through all of Ephesians. I said it, all of Ephesians. That's because Ephesians is a letter. Paul wrote literally a letter. We're getting a peek inside of someone's mail, which is so cool. So it was originally read the entire thing out loud. So that's how the original listeners would have heard it. And that's why I want to encourage you to read through all of Ephesians out loud in one sitting. Now, if that sounds too hard for you, if you don't have enough time, I completely understand. If you can't do that, then I want to encourage you guys to read at least Ephesians 5. So read through all of Ephesians 5, again, out loud and take your time. I'm going to ask you to pause the video and do that. Okay, now let's get into the context. Context is very important when studying the Bible. 
I mean very important. We have to remember that this was originally a letter. Who was it from and who was it to? It was from Paul, as you can see in Ephesians 1.1. And who is Paul? Paul was a apostle, which means that he saw Jesus Christ in person. Remember when he was on the road to Damascus in Acts, he saw Jesus face to face. He was a missionary, and may I say, the greatest missionary of all time. He was the first church planter, so the first guy to literally plant churches and start raising up churches. He was honestly on fire for Christ, and he played one of the biggest roles in starting to spread Christianity across the world. So, as you can see in Ephesians 1.1, we see who this letter was written to, and it was to the saints who were in Ephesus and were faithful in Christ. So, obviously, Paul is writing to people who are already believers. They have already accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That's important to know. And we also see that he is writing specifically to Gentile Christians, and Paul wrote to give them further teaching and encouragement. Now, you guys might be thinking, what the heck does Gentile mean? And Gentile, here's how I'll explain this. So, there are the Jews and there are the Gentiles. The Jews are the people who God called, like all of Israel, he called as a nation and said, you are my people, you are going to follow me, I am going to be your God, be holy for I am holy. And then there's everybody else, and those are all the Gentiles. <laughs> so, okay, God intended that it would be through the Jews, through Israel, that all the nations, all the Gentiles would be reached, and that all the Gentiles would be blessed. And it is through Jesus Christ and through the blood of the cross that the blessing of Jesus in becoming saved and becoming a child of God, it's not just for the Jews, it's for everybody. It's for all who have faith. And so back then in this historical cultural context, there was a distinction between Jews and Gentiles. What is amazing and what was so shocking to a lot of Jewish people was that Gentiles were becoming believers and we were coming into the family of God. So let's talk a little bit about Ephesus. Ephesus is where Paul was writing this letter to the church in Ephesus. Ephesus is the capital of the province of Asia during the Roman occupation. It is one of the largest and most important cities of the Roman Empire. Ephesus was huge, thriving, rich. There was probably around 250,000 people. There was a highway that went through it, obviously not with cars, but with, you know, goods and ships. It was just one of the stops on this large highway and it was a strong Romanized city. Now during this time, Roman had taken over a huge chunk of that area of the world and so the Roman people were ruling over this town also. So just imagine yourself a huge, thriving, bustling city. What were the main religious beliefs in this town? So there was a lot of different religious beliefs going around. There was the worship of Artemis, which if you want to read more about that, I'll put it right here. You can pause the video. There were numerous gods and goddesses that they worshipped. There was also a strong Jewish community in this area, and obviously the Jews worship one god, Yahweh. And also in this area, there was a strong reputation for practicing magic. So as you can see, and also obviously the Christian church was starting to form there, there was a big mix of religion going around, a lot of worship of God and goss goddesses in the temples through the Roman culture, and just a lot going on. So Paul took many missionary journeys. He took three. And on those journeys, one of the stops he made was Ephesus, and while he was there, he preached the gospel, 
And actually, we have all this written down in Acts 19 and Acts 20, 16 through 31. So I'm going to have you guys pause the video here and read through these two passages and summarize, write down and summarize what was the beginning of the church in Ephesus like and what are more details that you can grasp as you look to other parts of the Bible on what life was like in Ephesus. Okay, so now we're back. Good job reading through those passages and summarizing what life in Ephesus was like. Obviously, we wish we could go there and see or watch it on a movie screen, but we can't. So we have to, it's kind of like a puzzle that you have to grab all these different pieces, research, historical study, and just bring them all together to see what was life like in Ephesus back then. So the setup of the Ephesians can be split into two chunks, Ephesians 1 through 3 and Ephesians 4 through 6. Ephesians 1 through 3 can be summarized as the Gentile believers in Ephesus had been saved by grace through faith and were raised with Christ. So the first part of the letter is all about how Paul is saying, you are saved, you are believers, you are children of God. The second part, Ephesians 4 through 6, Paul was trying to show these Ephesians that they still had a calling for their present time on earth and they are to live in a manner that is worthy of the gospel. So that is the second part. The purpose of Ephesians is that the Gentile believers in Ephesus would know that God unified a new humanity in Jesus. Therefore, they are to live in a way that fosters that unity. Ephesians, I was so convicted as I read through it about the church and how God has called all people together, all cultures, all nations, Gentiles, Jews, everybody together, and we're all children of God, and he calls us to live in unity with each other, and he calls us to live in a Christ-like way in unity as the body of Christ. So where does our section fit into all of this? That's what we're getting at. We're kind of, we started with a funnel and we're all coming down because when you in-depth study a passage, you really got to know that context and then you just keep working your way down because in-depth study really gets into the nitty gritty details, but we need to know that overall, what is this about? Background knowledge, context, things like that. So how does Ephesians 5, 15 through 21 fit into this? It fits seamlessly because it further unpacks how they were to walk and live out their calling in their new united family of God. So it's going to further unpack how they are to live out the gospel daily. So as I go through this, I am going to consistently be referencing this outline. I'll put it on the screen right now. This outline is going to be huge and just extremely important because this is the outline of the text. So literally, I just took the text and put it word for word here, but it's also the outline of this video and, and this is gonna just really help you stay grounded and just keep in focus God's word as we end up study. Hey friends, so here I am on voiceover. Let's look at our outline and let's see what the study is going to be about. It's about being careful how you walk. So Ephesians 5.15 says, Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. So the overarching theme of the text that we're going to be studying is being careful how you walk. Feel free to take notes in your own Bible or in the printable pages. So this section starts with therefore. We need to think, what is it therefore? Obviously, if a section starts with therefore, you have to look back at the previous context. I'm going to ask you to pause the video here to read the immediate context, Ephesians 5, 1 through 14. All right, now that you have read that... Let's just summarize what the previous context is. It is Paul encouraging the Ephesians to walk in the light 
and to separate themselves from the darkness. I underlined be careful in red. I feel like red is just a caution color. So it says be careful. This is a warning, a pay careful attention. And it's very similar to how a loving father would teach his child. He's telling him to stay on the right path and watch out for danger. And the context, Ephesians 5, 6 and 5, 10 shows that danger. Ephesians 5, 6 says, let no one deceive you with empty words. And Ephesians 5, 10 says, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. So in their culture, there was obviously things that were dangerous or that they could that could pull them off to the wrong path. Obviously, that is the same for us today. And so we have to think, are we thinking carefully about the way we are living our life? It literally says, be careful how you walk. Are we being careful about how we walk? And we have to think, what is walk? Walk can be defined as one's lifestyle, how one conducts their life. Ephesians 2, 2, 2, 10, 4, 1, 4, 17, 5, 2, 5, 8, 5, 15, all have walk in it. If you guys go back, circle all these times Ephesians has walk. When things are repeated in the Bible, you know that is significant, okay? Paul is trying to show them that they need to be careful how are they they are living over and over again. And this is not only common in the New Testament, but also in the Old Testament. Psalm 119 said, Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who do no wrong, but walk in his ways. I mean, this is common in all of scripture. And then it says, Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. And the but shows a contrast here. It kind of is like putting this picture in your mind that there's two ways in life you can walk. You can walk in either the unwise path or on the wise path. Also known as the path of life is the wise path. And so that's what this contrast is showing. Well, Paul is telling them to be careful how they walk, but he's not just leaving them there. He's giving them practical ways they be, can be careful. And being wise is one of the ways he gives. Now, what is wisdom? Wisdom is knowing God's word and living it out. It's, it's not just knowing it it's living it proverbs 9 10 talks about how the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom and fearing the lord is loving and respecting god and when you love and respect god your heart will be in a place that wants to obey him and desires to obey him so what's the big idea of this verse one way to be careful how you walk which remember is the overarching idea is to choose God's way of wisdom by knowing scripture and living out scripture, by knowing God's word and living it out. That's how you choose wisdom. Okay, so we just saw that we need to be careful how we walk. The first way is not as unwise men, but as wise. And underneath being wise, Paul encourages to make the most of your time because the days are evil in Ephesians 5, 16. And we see that this passage is going from general to specific. So we saw generally that we need to be wise, but now Paul's giving us examples of how do you practically walk in wisdom. So he's giving you general truths and he's going to continue to go into specific truths. So we can be wise by making the most of our time. Why? Because the days are evil. So making the most of your time can also mean redeem or buying up. And it's a word that brings to mind someone snatching up their dog, their pet dog, before it runs away. Making the most of your time, snatching it. Like it's almost like you don't have it, you need it. You need to grab it before it's gone. You know what I mean? So time, if we really think about time, well, this will come to mind. It's a gift from God. It's a gift we have. It's something we literally can never get back. 
Keros is the Greek word, and it means God-given opportunity that the believer has to walk in wisdom. Time is valuable and entrusted to us so that we may be light in a dark world. It's a gift from God. It is not our own, okay? We are given this life so that we can be vessels for God in light. Time can also mean opportunities, seasons, occasions. The season of singleness that you're in, maybe that's an opportunity to be a light. Or maybe you're in a hard occasion, that's an opportunity to be a light. Whatever it is. And so I wrote out this little uh, clock and I split it up into three sections. Evil, decent, and best. And making the most out of your time makes you think, okay, there's good things I could be doing. There's evil things I could be doing, but there's really good, the best, most honorable things I could be doing. I guess what I'm trying to get across here is that there are things that we could be doing that are against God's word. We should not be doing that. But then there's decent things, like maybe spending seven hours on Netflix or 10 hours on Instagram. There's things that aren't wrong or bad, but might not be the best use of our time. But then there's the best things that we could be doing. And my question is, Are you making the absolute best of your time? Because that's what Paul says wisdom is. That's what Paul says when he says, be careful how you walk. Are you making the best use of the time God has given you? So you may be wondering, what are these things that could be the best use of my time? So throughout the letter, Paul gives things that we can be doing. Like, for example, giving thanks in Ephesians 5.4. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk, no crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Paul also talks about kindness and forgiveness, and he says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. He talks about loving one another, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. And then he also talks about speaking truth, which is hard. Put away all falsehood. Let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So making the most of your time, we talked about that. Because the days are evil, all believers will live in evil days until Jesus' second coming. They lived in evil days and so do we. Ephesians 4.14, Ephesians 4.17, Ephesians 5.6. All those are examples of how they were living in evil days. I'm going to read the second verse here to show you how they were living in evil days. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy, to practice every kind of impurity. So this is the culture that the Ephesians were living in. It was an evil culture, and I would argue that we also are living in a very evil culture still today, 2,000 years later. So as you can see, Paul is trying to put across a sense of urgency for all believers that we must make the best use of our time because the days are evil. So looking back at our chart, we must be careful how we walk. One, not as unwise, but as wise. And two, to not be foolish, but to understand what the will of God is. So we're getting into our second point on how we can be careful on how we walk. Again, this is going from general to specific. It is saying that in light of the days being evil, that's the context, we should not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. This is the second contrast that we're seeing. Remember, the first said we should be wise, not unwise. Now it's saying we should not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And we see this theme of putting off the old self and putting on the new self. This is a theme in Ephesians, and Ephesians 4, 22-24 says, Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on your new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness. 
Whew. So Paul is continuing on in that theme in this section that we're talking about today. He's saying, don't be foolish. Take off the old self. Foolish means senseless, inconsiderate, mindless, stupid, ignorant, rash, unbelieving. It acts thoughtlessly to fulfill their own desires, their own selfish desires. The person who is foolish does that. And we are living in evil days. We do not have time to be foolish. Paul is contrasting here how the foolish don't use their brain. And he says, but understand what the will of the Lord is. He's saying, use your mind. Don't be foolish. Do, don't be someone who doesn't use the mind God has given you. But understand, think, what is the will of the Lord? And we, you might be wondering, what the heck does it even mean, the will of the Lord? It means help and discernment on what will glorify God in everyday life. So that that's when we understand what the will of the Lord is. We're asking God to help us discern what will glorify him in everyday life. Understanding God's will means to think, ponder, consider, comprehend what the Lord desires. If in life we stop to think, will this please the Lord? Does this line up with scripture? Is this in line with the light of the gospel and the light and truth of Jesus Christ? We will be living in wisdom and walking carefully. That's what discerning what the will of the Lord is. We're asking ourselves, will this honor God? Will this glorify God? Is this something that God would want me to do? Is this me taking steps to fear the Lord and obey him and respect him? That is understanding what the will of the Lord is. We're ultimately seeking him instead of being foolish. Foolish is not seeking God at all. So the Ephesians lived in a culture that was living in complete foolishness, seeking their own will above God's will. You can see that with the pagan worship and magic just being two things that were foolish. Foolishness turns a blind eye to what God wants and only follows the flesh. Wisdom, on the other hand, seeks to understand God's will above all. This is a high and amazing calling believers have today. And let me tell you that our culture is not different from the culture the Ephesians were living in, okay? We are also trying to walk in wisdom in a culture that is foolish. And it is not easy. Okay, let's look back at our outline. Be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. Do not be foolish, but understand what God's will is. But we already went over those two. Now, what's the third point for how we can be careful how we walk? It is to not get drunk with wine, but to be filled with the Spirit. This is the last contrast. Remember, the first one was unwise versus wise. The second one was foolish versus understanding. And now the third one is drunk versus being filled with the Spirit. Again, it is going from general to very specific. This is a specific example of what being unwise and foolish looks like. A wise person, on the other hand, is filled with the Spirit. So, drunk. Let's get into this word. Drunk, I immediately thought about someone who's drunk. When they are drunk, they can't even understand their right arm, arm from their left, let alone the will of God, and let alone trying to walk wisely. So, drunkenness. Yes, I spelled that wrong. I'll fix it later. Okay, what did drunkenness mean to the original readers? It was a common theme in their mind. Proverbs 21. Foolishness had a strong connection to drunkenness, especially for the Jews who knew the Old Testament. It was a common theme in the Old Testament. It was common in Gentile and pagan culture. We see that in 1 Peter 2.4. It was a, gen a danger in the churches. In 1 Timothy and Titus, Paul tells them, be careful, don't get drunk, especially not the church leaders. And it was connected to the worship of false god. Whoa, I said that weird. It was connected to the worship of false gods. So as you can see, it was common to get drunk in their culture. 
But the Lord says, that is foolish, that is unwise. It is dissipation, which means uncontrolled action and wastefulness. It's the same word in Luke 15, 13, used with the prodigal son when he had riotous living. So when he squandered everything, he literally took his dad's money, left home, and spent it all doing things with prostitutes, partying, spent all his money, he ended up poor. And so that is the same word here, dissipation. And it leads to death. It leads to darkness. Remember those two paths I showed you at the beginning? Yeah, let's try not to take that dark path. The alternative to getting drunk and wasteful living is being filled with the spirit, which is a perfect contrast because both have to do with the self coming under the control of an external power. It's saying don't get drunk or be filled with alcohol. Instead, be filled with the spirit. I love this verse, you guys. This verse has stuck with me. I think it has stuck with me because I just see it so clearly in my mind. I drew this picture here of water flowing into a jar and filling it up completely. Filled can mean to fill up or be made full. Like in Matthew 13, 48, it says when the net was full, they dragged it up onto the shore. So you get this picture in your head of full being filled to the top. The spirit filling us is like fish being filled to the top of a net. It's that picture of something just being completely full. Every believer has the Holy Spirit dwelling within them, but not all believers are filled with the Spirit. Being filled by the Spirit is something that needs to happen daily when we submit ourselves to the Spirit of God. A believer must desire to be filled with with the spirit. Oh, all of this study I actually did months ago, like around four to five months ago. And this is the one thing that stuck with me through it all. As I pray daily, God continually reminds me to ask him to, to fill me with his spirit. So in my prayers, you guys, I'll literally just say, Lord, fill me with your spirit today. Help me, fill me. And it, it is a constant daily prayer that we as believers must be praying. Like I said earlier, if you're a believer, you're already sealed with the spirit. That means he is living within you and you do not have to be worried about losing the spirit of God living within you. But what I do think you should focus on is saying, spirit of the living God, fill me today. I want to follow you. I want to be able to be obedient to you. And I want to hear you speak to me. I want to feel those nudges in my heart. So that's what filling of the spirit means. So now we're still within the third point. Do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit. And that should result in these things happening. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God, and being subject to one another in the fear of Christ. So I got out my green color, and I just circled all the action steps it's saying to take. And then in purple, I highlighted God, and in pink, I highlighted others. And what I noticed was that a result of being filled with the Spirit leads to action. It leads to fruit in our lives. It leads to us doing things. And it leads to us better loving and worshiping God and better loving others. So that first point, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. All of these things are activities of worship that happened in the church. All of these things created unity as they worshiped God together. And you may be thinking, does it make sense that they are speaking to each other about psalms and hymns and spiritual songs? Well, look at the next line. It says, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. 
So as they sing and make melody to the Lord, they're also encouraging one another. Psalm 95 says, Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. And so that's an example of of how when we worship the Lord, we're also encouraging other. And so that first point is worship. The second point is worship. And the third point is also worship. It says, Always giving thanks for things in the name, all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. And so giving thanks is an act of worship and the goal of the spirit as you're filled with the spirit is to bring honor to god and jesus and thankfulness does that and it not only does that but it has the power to lift lift you out of any hard situation and out of the doldrums of everyday life which is amazing so as you can see being filled with the spirit helps us to worship god better helps us to live in unity better with each other, helps us to give thanks to God in all circumstances, and four, it helps us to be subject to one another in Christ. And that's an act of worship. It's a way to live out the gospel and to walk in Jesus' way, to follow his footsteps, and it brings honor and glory to God. And as you can see, all of these actions are an act of worship as the spirit fills us we're going to love god and love others better but remember it is only by the holy spirit that we can live a life of worship best loving god and others we try to do things on our own but we can't and this is why i ask god daily or i try to daily to help fill me with his spirit so that i can walk in wisdom understand the will of the Lord and love God and others better. So now we're back to the first sheet. Like I said, we were going to be coming around to this a lot, but let's just go over it one more more time. Be careful how you walk, not as unwise men as what, but as wise, making the most of your time. Two, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And three, Do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit, leading you to worship God through your voice, through singing, through speaking, giving thanks to the Lord and being subject to one another, being better able to worship God, love God, and love others. And so I want to ask you right now, I do not want you to leave this study without practically applying this scripture to your life. Maybe like it was for me, it'll be for you. The one thing I took away was me knowing that I needed to ask God daily to fill me with his spirit. That was the biggest takeaway I got from this the first time I did this study. But I don't know how God's moving in your heart. I don't know how the spirit's moving within you. But I want you to write down right now. What is going to change in your life because of this? How are your prayers going to change? How are your interactions with others going to change? What has God put on your heart that you need to do? Maybe it's about your time. Maybe you need to better use your time and literally snatch up your time because you can never get it back. Maybe it's that you need to stop drinking or getting drinking too much. I don't know. Drinking isn't bad, but drinking too much. I don't know. I don't know how God's going to convict you. But I pray that he will and that your life will change and that you would be filled with the spirit of the living God and that that would just change you and renew you. And sister in Christ, let me tell you, being filled with the spirit is the best decision and the best way you could ever live your life. Thank you so much for watching this study, you guys. I really hope that it was an encouragement to you. I really hope that it just will sharpen you and strengthen you in your faith. And I pray that as I pray daily, that the Lord would fill you with his spirit, that you would pray the same thing and that we would just be on fire for Christ. We would be in the word. We would be on our knees in prayer. We'd be sharing the gospel. I mean, Think about how much this world will be a different place if we ask God to continually fill us with his spirit. We're going to be living in a different place, people. So the world will change. 
as we change our hearts in God's word, as we are filled with the spirit. I love you guys. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks for watching to the end. Love you. Bye guys.